Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and business executives about some of the most urgent issues and frontier ideas in our world today. I'm Princeton Junior Tiger Gao. Uh, so today we're back with another episode on the coronavirus crisis. Uh, it's been spreading around for uh, around the U.S. for a couple of months at this point, and we're updating uh, two episodes per week. Uh, to try to bring the most frontier ideas uh, to you about the crisis. Uh, and today we're coming back to the issue of ethics and we're interviewing uh, Arthur Kaplan. He is the head of the Division of Medical Ethics at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. So basically the chief medical ethicist at NYU. And uh, he has written uh, so many renowned publications uh, in terms of medical ethics in, in this field, uh, making policies for public health, and also doing a lot of interview uh, with The Atlantic, uh, uh, Time Magazine, New York Times, all about this crisis. So it's such an honor for us uh, to have him join us on the show. Um, you may have noticed that we just published an episode with Professor Peter Singer of Princeton University uh, just a couple of days ago. And in that, uh, Professor Singer kind of just opposed two uh, very important ethical decisions that we have to make. The first one is about triage, basically rationing medical resources uh, to patients and deciding who to live and who to die in certain dire situations. And, this, and the second very important ethical question is the trade-off between opening up the economy and, and uh, keeping it shut down. So uh, we'll have this conversation with Dr. Kaplan, hear his thoughts on those issues, and go a little bit deeper uh, at, from his perspective as someone who is on the front line right now as a public health uh, expert and ethicist on the front line to hear what is actually going on in New York uh, among the hospitals. How are the doctors actually making those really tough ethical decisions? And what we can do to really reason through some of those important debates and uh, be a little bit more forward looking. So thank you again for following Policy Punchline and I wish you can enjoy this conversation with Dr. Kaplan. It's such an honor to, to actually talk, talk to you. I mean, I mean, you've been doing interviews with Time and New York Times and all kinds of media outlets. So it's such an honor for Policy Punchline, you know. Uh, I bet podcast. you're more impressed with Peter Singer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he certainly has more contrarian views, I would say. So, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love true. to hear, hear your thoughts uh, on those uh, in a true. bit. Uh, how are you doing? Good. Uh, I'm fine. You? Good. Good. Uh, you, you, Where I, are you? I, I'm in DC right now, Washington DC. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I'm in Ridgefield, Connecticut. That's where my house is. It's about 50 miles north of New York City. Got you. Uh, but you must be kind of on the front line of all this, right? Talking to people. And I think you mentioned... Well, we're setting up policies and giving advice on experimental drugs. And yeah, it's, I've never been uh, busier in a weird way. I thought, well, I would go home and it'll be boring and quiet. And that hasn't turned out to be true. Yeah, yeah. And then I'm still teaching classes. You know, for, for med students, they can't do anything clinical because they're out of the hospital if they're first or second years. So all they have is lecture courses. So I'm like, I'm teaching like four courses, you know, uh, that's all we've got on the curriculum to push them along until we get out of this thing. Totally, totally. So that's funny. Yeah, so, so why don't we j jump right in? Because there must be such a wide range of philosophical and ethical challenges coming out of this crisis what strike you as the most urgent ones? Well, I think there are probably three that are the most urgent among many. There are certainly no shortage of ethics crises, but the first one is when are we getting out of this? People want to know when they can go back to work, when they can go back to school, when the schools will open, and not just in the United States, worldwide. Um, and that involves a very delicate trade-off between bringing the uh, pandemic back, seeing the virus rebound and having to go through this all over again, or conceding that you're gonna take uh, losses and people will die, but it's still important to have the economy running and you're just gonna accept the trade-off. So that's a tough one. Second is uh, trying to figure out how to use your resources in the hospital. Many, many issues come up there about rationing and distributing scarce resources and personnel. And I might add first responders, they too can get overwhelmed with phone calls and requests to come. So what's fair, what's just, that's been a big issue for me. I've been involved in that a lot. And then the third is probably trying experimental drugs 
or things, for, uh, novel uses for approved drugs to try and help people either who are infected not become sicker or who are very sick and to try and help them. I think those are the big ones. Uh, so the second one you mentioned, which is the uh, rationing uh, of, of resources in, uh, in medical facilities, uh, does triage also kind of play a part in that in, in terms of, uh, it used to kind of be this fire chat hypothetical debate about who to tr mm. choose, where to live and die, whereas nowadays it seems very pressing. So how urgent is this situation today and, and how frequently do doctors actually have to make uh, those decisions and how would you recommend us to think? Well, as we speak today, interestingly enough, we've done the ethical thing, which is to avoid rationing by stretching resources. So one example, fourth year medical students at NYU, Harvard, other schools are now out on the floors. They graduated early. We got more doctors that way, but they're a little less experienced, a little less well-trained. You're making a trade-off, but it's better, you know, than sort of saying we don't have enough people to run the ICU. We're hiring people from retirement. So again, they're vulnerable, they're older usually, maybe skills are a little rustier, but we're avoiding rationing by doing that. We did manage to get our ventilators, uh, if you will, distributed to where the need is. I haven't seen anybody yet who's had to be declined a ventilator. Close, but not quite yet. So we haven't had rationing or triage as it's sometimes described yet, but the policies are in place. Some people argue that we shouldn't talk about this, didn't want to panic people. I completely disagree. If you're going to get people to accept the reality of rationing, they have to know how you're going to do it and when you're going to do it and why you're going to do it. So we have made up those policies. Give me one second. I'm just shutting off my beepy email here. I forgot. No, take your time. There we go. <laughs> Uh, so it seems that rationing needs to happen in two aspects. One is for the medical staff in terms of resources. The other is for the patients in terms of uh, using ventilators and, and medical resources. Uh, so would you mind just giving us a little bit uh, sort of your uh, standards or benchmarks that you use to, to think through some of those decisions? Well, let me say most people in bioethics and in fact, most people in healthcare have not done rationing, but I have. Many years ago, I was involved in setting up the system we use to distribute organs from deceased uh, people who die, cadaver donors, to people who need transplants, kidneys, livers, hearts, and they've always been in short supply, and we ration every day, and people die many more than get an organ every day. So in being around that system, I've known rationing firsthand. I've been on committees that have had to make decisions, and that shapes my thinking about what we're going to do today. Basically, with the scarce supply of organs, we do not take first come, first serve. There's no lottery. We try to get the most lives saved out of the supply of organs we have. So you make judgments based in transplant on biology, blood type match, tissue type match, size of organ. That gives you a first cut on who's likely to get a scarce organ because they have the best biological match. Then you start looking at underlying diseases. Do you have diabetes? Do you have hypertension? Are you obese? Do you have other problems we know complicate the success of a transplant? And by the way, so does advanced age. Independently of anything else, it's because you're starting to lose lung, kidney function. Just if you're over 80, you probably never heard of anybody getting a transplant over 80. It's not that they couldn't. We might be able to rescue some people, but they are so, they're disadvantaged to the point where they don't really make it. Those criteria are exactly what I slide over in trying to decide how to allocate, let's say, personnel or machines. Uh, machines, people with co uh, new coronavirus might need um, ventilators to breathe. They also just might need ECMO, which is a different kind of oxygen machine, or kidney dialysis sometimes, because kidney failure happens with this too. Who's most likely to live? You're looking again, well, let's put it this way. You put everybody in the life book. Disability, uh, race, gender, uh, whatever factors there are, they shouldn't matter initially. So you sort of decide, let's be fair, we'll consider everyone. So all seats open on the lifeboat to anybody, prisoners who might uh, be sick. But then you start to sort, if you will, the resource among the people on the lifeboat. For me, it's who's most likely whose life will be saved. When you 
you sometimes see other people get into this and they start to say, well, you know, we also want to save the longer life for people who are younger and would live 50. It never gets to that, to tell you the truth. It's all biology at the front end that usually sorts it out. If we had to, would I favor younger people against 70 year olds, other things being equal? Yes, partly for the what's called the fair innings or equality of opportunity of a life argument. I get that. Uh, we also have a kind of bias to help healthcare workers, first line responders to get them back to work. But I, I don't think we'll ever get to those criteria. It's basically, is this gonna work? And uh, what factors predict success? That's really interesting to hear that because you're saying we won't even get to the part when we have to use life expectancy or those very crude standards to judge things. We can just approach it by uh, using some of the standards we've already been using for organ transplants, such as you know biology, looking at chronic underlying diseases. And usually by those stages, we can already get a good sense of you know exactly. what to match and who, who to I say. Mean, I, I'm not going to say if somehow there was an explosion of patients showing up all at once in a Detroit ICU that we wouldn't start fishing around for the tiebreakers. It's very unlikely, though. The, the, the way we've tamped down the demand, it's big, but it's not overwhelming any particular place. So it's more likely you'd get two or three people. You're trying to figure out what to do. And one other point that I'm afraid many bioethicists don't realize, the other way you get resources is you take people off the machine. So if they're not doing well, you go quickly and say, look, under normal circumstances, you're 75 years old, you're a mess, you got three underlying diseases, we've got you on a vent. We know that this failure rate on a ventilator, best odds, 20% of people live. You don't look like you're flourishing. We've had you in here six or seven days. We're gonna make an earlier decision to give up. It's more likely we'd be generous at the front end and sort out who didn't respond at the back end to generate resources. So the, 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 the sorting out process that, that takes place later, uh, that is indeed happening, you would say. We, we do have to unplug certain people out of. I would say we are definitely giving up when, when an experienced ICU person says, these labs are horrible, the measurements we're getting off this person is bad, plus they have profile, we're likely to stop and move on. By the way, that's not just for the machine, it's to relieve the person as they're working 12 hour shifts, they're burning out, you're trying not to exhaust them. So you, you know, you can keep them going and going. And we're not doing resuscitation. So if somebody's on one of those units and they have a heart attack and they stop, we're not gonna send in people to try and do all the things you see on TV with the pads and the heart massage and the whole thing. We don't even have those people to do that. So again, I think there's more likely to be resource limitation on the back end than I've seen on the front end. Uh, so uh, you mentioned this very uh, key, uh, important key phrase, which is everybody should be considered equally. Um, so, so that means what, whether, what, no, certainly whatever race uh, you, you are and, and, and gender and uh, socioeconomic class, you should be considered equally. But what about issues like disability or, or uh, chronic conditions that are very unfortunate, you know, pre-existing conditions? Yeah. How should we think so, through those? So people have said... And there have been lawsuits against a couple of states that said we're not going to do people with cognitive impairment, that that's discriminatory. And I agree with that. I think that's wrong. I think you should consider, I mean, maybe someone who's in what we call a permanent coma can't sense the world has no sentience or interactivity. Okay, that doesn't make much sense to use resources there. But if it's a Downs child, I would have them in on the lifeboat. Their parents say they're, you know, enjoying life. It's not like they can't enjoy themselves and they may have a bit shorter life because of that condition. But no, I would put in everyone, it's, it's stretch it. Prisoners, uh, people with mental illness. Um, but does that still not acknowledge the fact that the poor, for example, if you take a standard of who's likely to do the best are disadvantaged and they are in the US, just because we have bad health insurance coverage and a lot of people don't have their chronic conditions managed and they get worse, then when they show up in the lifeboat, they are at a disadvantage because they have these chronic conditions. And people have said, well, then you're just penalizing the poor and you shouldn't do that. 
if you go with the idea that you have to try and save the most lives, it's not racist because a wealthy minority person might do be much more healthy than a poor minority person. But the reality is, if the principle is correct of maximize the utility of the resources you've got, whether it's transplants or ICU beds or ventilators or kidney dialysis, there are people who catch it twice. They didn't get good care at the front end. They were, their diabetes was not managed or detected early enough. And now they're in the lifeboat. What we're saying, you know, with, that, with those conditions, you're not going to do well with a ventilator. I feel horrible about it, but there's no, I think the principle is still sound. So I guess one might criticize, uh, you know, this process of prioritizing patients who are inherently healthier than, than the others. You know, they, they might say this process isn't truly fair, much as what you just portrayed it. So maybe we should uh, stick to maybe first comes first serve or, or some other principles. So do you think in crisis moments like this, we, we can have a standard that is truly fair? And how, how do you see those utilitarian debates sort of come in into yeah. the picture? Well, look, what is the point of having health care? It isn't to give everybody a chance at health care. It's to try and use your resources to save the most lives. That's what hospitals, doctors exist for. It's not a lottery. It's not a first come, first serve system. It's not like saying everybody ought to have a chance to get a seat at the beach, regardless of who they are. And, you know, if they're disabled and take longer to get down to the beach, well, so what? They still should sit there. I don't see that as the goal of healthcare. The goal of healthcare is to save people. The goal of healthcare is to use your resources to minimize uh, death. And by the way, to minimize disability too, although that doesn't become so relevant here. So if those are the goals, then you use your resources consistent. Does that disadvantage people? It does. It absolutely does. But I don't see any way around it. And I can't say it's not just because I still think it's consistent with the goal. If we had a situation on a lifeboat, we were just giving out food and we had 10 people and two of them had terminal cancer, should we give the food to everybody equally? Probably not. You, you, pro you probably should give people who have higher life expectancies. Yeah. In that so, sense. you know, that's what you're looking at. Is it their fault that they had terminal cancer? Could we have prevented the cancer if we detected it earlier in a system that said everybody will get to the doctor and have early detection of their breast cancer or prostate cancer? Sure, that would be great. I'm for it. I hope we go fix this once this pandemic is over. It's showing every gap in the American healthcare system that should have been fixed a long time ago. But here we are, and that's the reality. By the way, again, I don't mean to sound hard-nosed about it, but in doing this in transplant over the years, the same things happen. People are alcoholics. People are suicidal. They didn't get good mental health. But if you're a chronic alcoholic, you're not going to do well with a liver transplant. There's no point in pretending otherwise. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Uh, so if we become forward looking a little bit, how do you... Let me add, sorry, if you're a chronic yes. alcoholic who hasn't been sober for two years, if you're still drinking, the time we're thinking about giving you a liver transplant, that's going to cut the odds that you're going to get it. I think those are indeed very, very tough ethical questions, basically all pushed into this very short period of time, and we have to make lots of them. So oh, how let, do you... Let me add, no, it's funny, Tyre, let me add one other thing. People have also said, well, let's refer these decisions to a committee or ethics or some God squad. Or or algorithm, algorithm, yeah. An algorithm. algorithm. Yeah. I'm not going to do the algorithm because the algorithm, the people behind it, it's not the same biases and presumptions don't drive the algorithm. There's nothing number I fear saved and I feed the information the algorithm about what it'll do what I'm doing. It's not... We have to settle that issue. It's not disguised by having a computer do something, if you know what I mean. It's, that's, that's, that's not the way it works. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, comes up here is you don't have time to refer it to a committee. It's one thing to say, let's make a decision about who's going to get a transplant because a person's waiting. They're on dialysis. They're not going to die in the next 24 hours. You have some time to think it through. A crunch at the ER, a crunch at the ICU, you've got minutes. There's not going to be in a referral. You try to train people to know what they ought to think about and do and get them prepared. But 
they're, they're not going to call up an ethics committee and say, kick this around for an hour or two and let us know. There's no how it works in the real world of hospital admission. Uh, but but it, it would be somewhat reasonable to have the hospital uh, kind of tell their staff, maybe those are some of the criteria we should stick for. And, and this is the sort of the yes. consensus of the medical yes. community. Yes. And, so and giving advice that way, that's what I've primarily been doing during this pandemic is formulating the policies, then making sure we train people. You don't want to just say, oh, today's the first day we have to ration, here's the policy, because then they're, we're, they're having the discussion that we're having, is that right? Do I want to do that? And emotionally, you know, I've been involved with rationing transplants and watching people die and watching people told no for many years. Most of the people doing the rationing today are not experienced at that. It's emotionally awful. It should be. It's terrible. But you, you have to train them as well as have the policy. Both go hand in hand because you got to get them you have to get them ready to do it. Some might just walk away and say, I can't do it if you don't get them prepared. So there is a lot of human factors and playing into the nuanced situations uh, case by case. Absolutely. Exactly. And I, I'll say this too. There's going to be some judgment at the end of the day, the ER doc or the ICU doc who's experienced, you can tell them this is what factors we think are relevant. But if they eyeball that patient and say, you know, I don't see any underlying diseases, but your oxygen levels are terrible and you look awful, I'm not putting you in. There will be some of that just based on judgment. Uh, so how do you see this crisis uh, causing more permanent changes in the medical community, in medical practice? Uh, because, you know, triaging, rationing, all done in sort of a short time period of time. Uh, wouldn't that shed some light into our future practices? Yes. So we're going to see many, many things fall out of this uh, mess that we're in. One obvious thing is to stockpile equipment, be better prepared with protective gear, have a national uh, depot of ventilators and other equipment swabs for testing, test themselves. We would be fools if we did not start to warehouse and upkeep a supply. There's nothing to stop other uh, viruses from assaulting us, whether they're swine flu or Ebola or who knows what, uh, we have to prepare differently than we have. Most hospitals operate with what's called just in time, meaning they don't have extra supplies of anything. It's cheaper <laughs> to run that way. Can't do it. You got to keep some extra space and extra supplies locally. I know that's not maximizing business efficiency, but I think it maximizes healthcare uh, reactivity. I never I can make this prediction with certainty. There will be so much more telemedicine in the future. We won't even remember that we used to go to the doctor's office because we had a flu or the cold. It was ridiculous then because you were infecting other people and traveling with things like the flu. There's no point you can do it like we're doing it now with a, a Zoom link or a video link or a web link. Many, many things can be diagnosed and treated without telling the person, yeah, you look sick. Why don't you take your flu-like symptoms, ride the subway, infect everybody there, sit in my office, infect everybody there, and then walk in here and infect me as the doctor. So That I, won't happen. I guess the one interesting question that could be asked in that situation is that uh, should the government uh, intervene more into our personal decisions in order to achieve public, better public health outcomes? For example, uh, during flu, future flu seasons, the government comes out with the law and say, everybody is compelled to wear masks in public. Uh, you just have to do it, which will certainly decrease the number of de deaths, but people won't feel comfortable doing that. Well, so. remember, you're talking to a guy <laughs> some years ago pushed through mandatory flu vaccines for all healthcare workers or you get fired. That's my policy. So I'm a big believer in government taking away some liberties. There were nurses and doctors and healthcare workers who didn't like that idea but we have a 99.6% uh, flu vaccination rate at NYU. Pretty soon, I'm sure we'll get the numbers that show that not only did we benefit uh, people who were sick from infecting the docs, but we had less people sick out because they got the flu and didn't come to work. So I do favor tougher public health measures in the face of infectious disease. I think masking makes sense, but even more so, telemedicine makes more sense. It's like Stop putting people who are sick out in the public. Have them do their thing. 
remotely. You know, the management of the flu, what is it? The fluids, get some rest, watch your fever. If you really spike, go to the ER kind of thing. But it's not like you have to come in. Moms are worried about their kids uh, with coughs and so on. And it's like, you can manage this without people slipping around. So I think it's not so much that the government will do it. I think most hospitals and healthcare systems, even your primary care providers, they're going to start to say, let's do a lot of this online. Uh, I know you have to go soon. So I just want to quickly wrap up the, the interview asking you t- two quick questions. One is, uh, you mentioned there are three urgent uh, debates, and we spend most majority of this interview talking about the second one, which is resource rationing. Uh, and but you also brought up experimental drugs use, uh, uh, drug experiments, uh, upcoming trials, and then also uh, the decision between open up the economy and so. So I would love to hear your quick thoughts on those issues. Well, let's do the going back to work first, only because I think that on the minds of a lot of people staring at the same walls or the same people for a month. Um, I think what we're going to do is this. As soon as we get cheap and easy to administer tests, these are saliva tests. Uh, Interesting enough, Rutgers just announced that they have one, and I think others will appear. They are much easier to do because you can just spit and get an answer within a few hours. That's the road to getting out. You can test and say you're positive, don't come out yet. You're negative and you're not in a risk group, come on out. There's also testing that's blood testing to see if you have antibodies to the virus, meaning you're immune. Are we 100% sure that you're immune? No, but it's, I'm going to say it's, it's likely enough that if you've survived this or been infected and you didn't have any symptoms, you're probably going to come out too. So what I'm going to predict is this. We're going to come out by the millions, not all at once. It's not going to be a magic day. It's not going to be May 31st, everybody out. I think we'll see. We've got 10 minutes to use those on industry folks determined by probably the governors in their states and then 10 million more and then 10 million more and the people who are the highest risk elderly of death i mean or immune depleted people they'll probably come out last but i think that's the way it'll roll testing is the key i mean maybe we'll get a vaccine in a year and that's great too but i i I don't think we're going to see anything like that before at least a year maybe more and i can tell you why it's not just discovering it realize you have to make like just for the U.S. 330 million doses. It's a little manufacturing problem. You got to make sure you make them all safely. So that's why it takes a while. Uh, that's why you sent me this article that you just wrote for the Time magazine called There's mm-hmm. Only One Way to Get the U.S. Back to Work. Testing, testing, and more testing. Yep. And, that, and that's the key. And, uh, uh, artifi- on the experimental drugs, just quickly, there's no drug out there that works. We have no evidence. The president got wound up about these anti-malarial drugs. There was a report out of France that seemed to indicate on 26 people that some had benefited. Turns out the paper was bogus and it had to be retracted. The guy lied. I guess uh, the president, however, still under steam, under power from that initial optimism, keeps promoting this thing. And and, and, sorry, I was just saying in the medical community and also for the public to understand uh, evidence of absence or absence of evidence and, and understanding the actual probabilities involved in, in how successful a trial right. could be, it's, 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 it's uh, really hard. Well, yeah. here, here's an old rule from human experimentation that scientists aren't proud of, but I know it. If the person gets better, it must be the experimental drug. If they died, it's the underlying disease. Now, that's <laughs> cool, but people, <laughs> you see it all the time. Because people don't want to think they gave you something that killed you. So it's like, oh, it must be the disease. It must be the disease. Anyway, yeah. I'm not against trying new things. I understand these are desperate times for many people who are not doing well on the ventilators and so on. But you have to do it in an organized way. Otherwise, you don't know. Should I give them two doses at 20 milligrams or three times a day at 10 milligrams? Or does it matter if I give it bloodstream or they inhale it? So, yes, try new things, try them out, realize they're all long shots. Uh, If it was easy to cure this thing, we probably would have had a cure for the common cold, of which this is in the same family years ago. But do it in a systematic, organized way. Compare doses, record the health status of the person you're giving it to. Did you give it to them when they first became seropositive? Did you give it to them at the last gasp on a ventilator that matters in terms of whether the thing's going to work? Right now, there are 200 drugs that people are starting to trial. The president is in love with one of those. 
If you don't set this up, you're never going to know whether any of them worked if you just keep throwing them at patients. So I think there we've got to be, we want to be hopeful, but we don't want to be stupid. Absolutely. I know you have to go. So one last thing, the name of our show is Policy Punchline. I just want to ask you at the end, what's your punchline here for our, for our listeners? One thing that they should really take away. The science is what we have to rely on. And I think if we let the ethics, when we come out, who gets care, how do we deal with experimental drugs? If we use what we know from science, we'll come out okay. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Kaplan. It's been such a wonderful conversation. Hey, thanks for having me. This and, was and great. I, and I hope you're doing well and, and you're staying, staying safe. I am, you too. And uh, send me a link to this. We'll pump it around in the uh, ether. Of course. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we can keep you in touch. Thanks so much. So that was our interview with Dr. Arthur Kaplan. He is the head of the Division of Medical Ethics at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, we talked about some of the most urgent ethical concerns in the COVID-19 crisis, and he brought up uh, three urgent ones. The first one is sort of the trade-off between the economy and public health. You know, should we uh, open up the economy? When should we do it? Especially given how it is very likely that even if we suppress uh, this current trend, if we flatten the curve uh, in another couple of months, uh, there might be another outbreak coming back. So how do we open up the economy then? What's the kind of the measures that we need to take? Uh, that's sort of the first urgent concern. The second urgent concern uh, is about rationing resource use, uh, especially for, uh, it, in this case, very unique situation is for the, the medical staff. It, it, it used to be that rationing happens uh, with uh, the patients, such as organ transplants and such. But now even the medical staff, the medical workers, will need to ration among themselves protective gear, masks, and, and things as such. The third question that we talked about is uh, the experiments on novel drugs that could be used to address the COVID-19 crisis right now. And there is this concept I brought up called um, absence of evidence versus evidence of absence that I would love to just quickly clarify here for our listeners who might not be familiar with this thing. I actually just learned about that uh, in this book I've been reading. It's called Food by Randomness by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And he, he talked about this probability concept, uh, w w which is that, let's say there is some new drug trial like chemotherapy or, or some new drug uh, that it improves the survival from 21% uh, to 24%. So there's a 3% improvement. But uh, because that improvement is somewhat small, uh, another person observing from outside the trial might say that is uh, due to randomness or some other error that uh, might not fully say it is this 3% is due to the effect of the drug. So he, this, this outsider might write a paper outlining this result and saying that there is no evidence of improved survival from such medicine and further research would be needed. And in this case, this is absence of, of evidence. However, a journalist might pick up on this and would write an article with the headline saying, someone observed this drug trial and said the, the drug does not work, um, which is evidence of absence. But that's not what the outside observer was saying at all. The outside observer was simply saying that you should do more trials related to the drug. So uh, in terms of probability, in terms of how we understanding conditional probability, in terms of how we understand uh, the, the chances actually involved in the successes of, of, of those drug trials is very, very delicate, very, very nuanced. Um, and, and that is the concept I brought up in terms of absence of evidence versus uh, evidence of absence. Uh, and I think Dr. Kaplan did a wonderful job cap capturing uh, the, the delicacy when it comes to actually uh, figuring out how to administer uh, uh, effective drug uh, and, and how to actually do it in a systematic and scientific fashion. And that is why when our president uh, says, you know, this one drug could immediately be released and, and gives those promises, it might not be the most scientifically sounding way of uh, spreading information. Uh, if you would like to learn more about some of the debates, no matter when it comes to media communications or when it comes to uh, deeper ethical debates, or it could be the debate between economic trade-off and uh, public health outcomes, uh, you can visit us on policypunchline.com slash COVID-19. We are doing, as I said before, two episodes per week right now, uh, trying to bring the most frontier ideas 
uh, from from some of the most accomplished thinkers from the world all to uh, the podcast platform. Visit us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or any other platform you may find us. Uh, rate and review us. Visit us on policypunchan.com. Thank you again so much for listening today.